So, the first two sessions we were looking at the micro-reality of our faith at work. Now we're going to look at the macro-reality. And the reason why we're going to do that is because faith and work and economics all go together. Uh, we don't do work in, a, in an economic vacuum any more than we do ministry in a theological vacuum. We need to understand the impact that decisions have on the quality of people's lives, on our culture, how we treat each other, what is just, what is unjust, what is fair, what is unfair. We have to think of all of these issues because, frankly, this is where the rubber really meets the road. And because we live in a liberal democracy... Before, because we adhere to a free market economic system, we are not morally unresponsible for how that system works. That's just, the, that's just the way it is. We do not have the option to say economics is beyond our control any more than we have the option to say politics is beyond our control because all of us participate in economics and as Christians, we are called to have a prophetic voice against all power systems, and economics is a power system. So we're going to unpack some of this today. This is the essence of the book that I just finished, which isn't out yet, which I promise I will come back if you'll have me uh, next year, and we can, we can unpack this a little bit more. But here's the reason why I'm doing it. I'm a capitalist, okay? I'm not going to throw capitalism under the bus here. I'm a capitalist. But I'm also a little bit like the poacher who turned gamekeeper. Because I have seen the good and the bad and the ugly of capitalism. And I was the least surprised person in the world when we had the global financial crisis of 2008. Because what caused the global financial crisis of 2008 was two things. One was technical. You had too much cash chasing too few assets. It caused an unsustainable bubble, and the bubble burst. That is economics. The second was moral. There was phenomenal greed, debt, and deception in the system. And that greed, unbridled, unimaginable greed, and debt and deception created an unsustainable model for that period and it had to come crashing down. And when those things happen, who gets hurt the most? Not the people at the top. It's the people that Jesus tells us we must care for the most, which is the poor and the powerless and the marginalized. So I'm going to talk to you today during this section about what I call postmodern capitalism, which is capitalism which isn't the capitalism we bargained for. It isn't the capitalism of Adam Smith. It isn't the capitalism of Max Weber. It isn't a capitalism rooted in the Judeo-Christian ethic that it was born in. It was born in. It is a capitalism which is devoid of a moral compass and impervious if not, I'm sorry, and resistant, if not impervious, to ethical constraint. And that, that's a bad kind of capitalism. And only we can fix it. Just like the congressman I talked about last night, a self-governing workplace, only they can fix it. Only we can fix capitalism. But it's going to take political will, and Christians and other people of good faith are going to have to say, wait a minute. We love our economic system. We love the free market. We think it creates wealth for the benefit of humankind, and it does. But it has a dark side. And we can't ignore the dark side. That's the hard part of being a Christian. Is sometimes you have to speak against the very things you value most. That's part of being a Christian. The other reason why I will mention it is because, like our guest in this previous video just said, we are on the cusp of the greatest change in the history of humankind when it comes to technology. And that is, in the past, any of you, I don't know if any of you read the article that was in the newspaper yesterday or Sunday, uh, or when was it last, last Sunday? Uh, about the Industrial Revolution. I wrote an article for the Dispatch. Um, if you think the Industrial Revolution 
was unsettling socially to the people of 19th century England. Wait till you see what's coming down the pike. This is what I do for a living now, is I spend time with MIT and I look at what's happening with uh, the ethics of artificial intelligence and how we use, we combine artificial intelligence and, and robotics to do things that before only humans can do, and here's why. During the first industrial revolution, we created machines to replicate our bodies. In this coming industrial revolution, we are creating machines to replicate our minds. There is a quantitative shift there. We have built cognition into machines. And it's going to have an economic and moral impact on all of us. And I'm convinced the reason why Marxism was successful as it was, especially in Europe in the 19th century, is because the church was nowhere to be found. The church did not inform the debate, and the church wasn't there to pick up the pieces when they came falling down. And I got news for you. It's probably the single greatest opportunity for the church in 200 years to be an impactful element for good in our culture. Because if the church does its job, we have nothing to fear from the future. We have the opportunity to ensure that it's a future full of grace and justice and wisdom. And if it, the church is at the front end, people are going to say, why are these people doing it? What is it about Christians that makes them care about the poor, about the marginalized, about economics? What, what is it? Now, I just want to make something clear here. This isn't about politics. This is not about politics. But it is about policy. And it is about ensuring that we hold people to account in the corporate world, as well as in government, to ensure that what's coming down the pike doesn't run us all over. So I'm going to show you a video. This is the longest of the videos, but I have to show it to you because I want you to know that I didn't make this stuff up. The stuff that's coming down the road is very interesting. So the title of this video is called Humans Need Not Apply. And, and by the way, those are the Luddites. Who, who smashed up the machines in the, in the uh, 18th century. Every human used to have to hunt or gather to survive, but humans are smartly lazy, so we made tools to make our work easier. From sticks to plows to tractors, we've gone from everyone needing to make food to modern agriculture with almost no one needing to make food and yet we still have abundance. Of course, it's not just farming, it's everything. We've spent the last several thousand years building tools to reduce physical labor of all kinds. These are mechanical muscles, stronger, more reliable, and more tireless than human muscles ever could be. And that's a good thing. Replacing human labor with mechanical muscles frees people to specialize, and that leaves everyone better off, even those still doing physical labor. This is how economies grow and standards of living rise. Some people have specialized to be programmers and engineers whose job is to build mechanical minds. Just as mechanical muscles made human labor less in demand, so are mechanical minds making human brain labor less in demand. This is an economic revolution. You may think we've been here before, but we haven't. This time is different. When you think of automation, you probably think of this. Giant, custom-built, expensive, efficient, but really dumb robots blind to the world and their own work. They were a scary kind of automation, but they haven't taken over the world because they're only cost-effective in narrow situations. But they're the old kind of automation. This is the new kind. Meet Baxter. Unlike these things which require skilled operators and technicians and millions of dollars, Baxter has vision and can learn what you want him to do by watching you do it, and he costs less than the average annual salary of a human worker. Unlike his older brothers, he isn't pre-programmed for one specific job. He can do whatever work is within the reach of his arms. Baxter is what might be thought of as a general purpose robot, and general purpose is a big deal. Think computers. They too started out as highly custom and highly 
relatively expensive, but when cheap-ish general-purpose computers appeared, they quickly became vital to everything. A general-purpose computer can just as easily calculate change, or assign seats on an airplane, or play a game, or do anything just by swapping its software. And this huge demand for computers of all kinds is what makes them both more powerful and cheaper every year. Baxter today is the computer of the 1980s. He's not the apex, but the beginning. Even if Baxter is slow, his hourly cost is pennies worth of electricity, while his meat-based competition costs minimum wage. A tenth the speed is still cost-effective when it's a hundredth the price. And while Baxter isn't as smart as some of the other things we will talk about, he's smart enough to take over many low-skilled jobs. And we've already seen how dumber robots than Baxter can replace jobs. In new supermarkets, what used to be 30 humans is now one human overseeing 30 cashier robots. Or take the hundreds of thousands of baristas employed worldwide. There's a barista robot coming for them. Sure, maybe your guy makes the double mocha whatever just perfect and you'd never trust anyone else, but millions of people don't care and just want a decent cup of coffee. Oh, and by the way, this robot is actually a giant network of robots that remembers who you are and how you like your coffee no matter where you are. Pretty convenient. We think of technological change as the fancy new expensive stuff, but the real change comes from last decade stuff getting cheaper and faster. That's what's happening to robots now. And because their mechanical minds are capable of decision-making, they are out-competing humans for jobs in a way no pure mechanical muscle ever could. Imagine a pair of horses in the early 1900s talking about technology. One worries all these new mechanical muscles will make horses unnecessary. The other reminds him that everything so far has made their lives easier. Remember all that farm work? Remember running from coast to coast delivering mail? Remember riding into battle? All terrible. These new city jobs are pretty cushy, and with so many humans in the cities, there will be more jobs for horses than ever. Even if this car thingy takes off, he might say, there will be new jobs for horses we can't imagine. But you, dear viewer, from beyond 2000, know what happened. There are still working horses, but nothing like before. The horse population peaked in 1915. From that point on, it was nothing but down. There isn't a rule of economics that says better technology makes more better jobs for horses. It sounds shockingly dumb to even say that out loud, but swap horses for humans and suddenly people think it sounds about right. As mechanical muscles pushed horses out of the economy, mechanical minds will do the same to humans. Not immediately, not everywhere, but in large enough numbers and soon enough that it's going to be a huge problem if we're not prepared. And we're not prepared. You, like the second horse, may look at the state of technology now and think it can't possibly replace your job, but technology gets better, cheaper, and faster at a rate biology can't match. Just as the car was the beginning of the end for the horse, so now does the car show us the shape of things to come. Self-driving cars aren't the future. They're here and they work. Self-driving cars have traveled hundreds of thousands of miles up and down the California coast and through cities all without human intervention. The question is not if they'll replace cars, but how quickly. They don't need to be perfect, they just need to be better than us. Human drivers, by the way, kill 40,000 people a year with cars just in the United States. Given that self-driving cars don't blink, don't text while driving, don't get sleepy or stupid, it's easy to see them being better than humans because they already are. Now, to describe self-driving cars as cars at all is like calling the first cars mechanical horses. Cars in all their forms are so much more than horses that using the name limits your thinking about what they can even do. Let's call self-driving cars what they really are. Autos, the solution to the transport objects from point A to point B problem. Traditional cars happen to be human-sized to transport humans, but tiny autos can work in warehouses and gigantic autos can work in pit mines. Moving stuff around is who knows how many jobs, but the transportation industry in the United States employs about 3 million people. Extrapolating worldwide, that's something like 70 million jobs at a minimum. These jobs are over. The usual argument is that the unions will prevent it, but history is filled with workers who fought technology that would replace them, and the workers always lose. Economics always wins, and there are huge incentives across wildly diverse industries to adopt autos. For many transportation companies, humans are about a third their total costs. That's just the straight salaries. Humans sleeping in their long-haul trucks cost time and money. Accidents cost money. Carelessness costs money. If you think insurance companies will be against it, guess what? Their perfect driver is one who pays their small premiums and never gets into an accident.
The autos are coming, and they're the first place where most people will really see the robots changing society. But there are many other places in the economy where the same thing is happening, just less visibly. So it goes with autos, so it goes for everything. It's easy to look at autos and Baxters and think technology has always gotten rid of low-skilled jobs we don't want people doing anyway. They'll get more skilled and do better educated jobs like they've always done. Even ignoring the problem of pushing a hundred million additional people through higher education, white-collar work is no safe haven either. If your job is sitting in front of a screen and typing and clicking, like maybe you're supposed to be doing right now, the bots are coming for you too, buddy. Software bots are both intangible and way faster and cheaper than physical robots. Given that white-collar workers are, from a company's perspective, both more expensive and more numerous, the incentive to automate their work is greater than low-skilled work. And that's just what automation engineers are for. These are skilled programmers whose entire job is to replace your job with a software bot. You may think even the world's smartest automation engineer could never make a bot to do your job, and you may be right, but the cutting edge of programming isn't super smart programmers writing bots, it's super smart programmers writing bots that teach themselves how to do things the programmer could never teach them to do. How that works is well beyond the scope of this video, but the bottom line is there are limited ways to show a bot a bunch of stuff to do, show the bot a bunch of correctly done stuff, and it can figure out how to do the job to be done. Even with just a goal and no knowledge of how to do it, the bots can still learn. Take the stock market, which in many ways is no longer a human endeavor. It's mostly bots that taught themselves to trade stocks, trading stocks with other bots that taught themselves. As a result, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange isn't filled with traders doing their day jobs anymore. It's largely a TV set. So bots have learned the market and bots have learned to write. If you've picked up a newspaper lately, you've probably already read a story written by a bot. There are companies that teach bots to write anything, sports stories, TPS reports, even say those quarterly reports that you write at work. Paperwork, decision-making, writing, a lot of human work falls into that category, and the demand for human mental labor in these areas is on the way down. But surely the professions are still safe from bots, yes? When you think lawyer, it's easy to think of trials, but the bulk of lawyering is actually drafting legal documents, predicting the likely outcome and impact of lawsuits, and something called discovery, which is where boxes of paperwork gets dumped on the lawyers and they need to find the pattern or the one out-of-place transaction among it all. This can be bot work. Discovery, in particular, is already not a human job in many law firms. Not because there isn't paperwork to go through, there's more of it than ever, but because clever research bots shift through millions of emails and memos and accounts in hours, not weeks, crushing human researchers in terms of not just cost and time, but most importantly, accuracy. Bots don't get sleepy reading through a million emails. But that's the simple stuff. IBM has a bot named Watson. You may have seen him on TV destroy humans at Jeopardy, but that was just a fun side project for him. Watson's day job is to be the best doctor in the world, to understand what people say in their own words and give back accurate diagnoses. He's already doing that at Sloan Kettering, giving guidance on lung cancer treatments. Just as autos don't need to be perfect, they just need to make fewer mistakes than humans, the same goes for doctor bots. Human doctors are by no means perfect. The frequency and severity of misdiagnoses are terrifying, and human doctors are severely limited in dealing with a human's complicated medical history. Understanding every drug and every drug's interaction with every other drug is beyond the scope of human knowability. Especially when there are research robots whose whole job it is to test thousands of new drugs at a time. And human doctors can only improve through their own experiences. Doctor bots can learn from the experience of every doctor bot, can read the latest in medical research and keep track of everything that happens to all their patients worldwide and make correlations that would be impossible to find otherwise. Not all doctors will go away, but when the doctor bots are comparable to humans and they're only as far away as your phone, the need for general doctors will be less. So professionals, white-collar workers, and low-skill workers all have things to worry about from automation. But perhaps you are unfazed because you're a special creative snowflake. Well, guess what? You're not that special. Creativity may feel like magic, but it isn't. The brain is a complicated machine, perhaps the most complicated machine in the whole universe, but that hasn't stopped us from trying to simulate it. There is this notion that just as mechanical muscles allowed us to move into thinking jobs, that mechanical minds will allow us to move into creative work. 
But even if we assume the human mind is magically creative, it's not, but just for the sake of argument, artistic creativity isn't what the majority of jobs depend on. The number of writers and poets and directors and actors and artists who actually make a living doing their work is a tiny, tiny portion of the labor force. And given that these are professions dependent on popularity, they'll always be a very small portion of the population. There can't be such a thing as a poem and painting based economy. Oh, by the way, this music in the background that you're listening to, it was written by a bot. Her name is Emily Howell, and she can write an infinite amount of new music all day for free. And people can't tell the difference between her and human composers when put to a blind test. Talking about artificial creativity gets weird fast. What does that even mean? But nonetheless, it's a developing field. People used to think that playing chess was a uniquely creative human skill that machines could never do, right up until the point they beat the best of us. And so it will go for all human talents. Right, this may have been a lot to take in, and you might want to reject it. It's easy to be cynical of the endless and idiotic predictions of futures that never are. So that's why it's important to emphasize again that this stuff isn't science fiction. The robots are here right now. There is a terrifying amount of working automation in labs and warehouses around the world. We have been through economic revolutions before, but the robot revolution is different. Horses aren't unemployed now because they got lazy as a species, they're unemployable. There's little work that a horse can do to pay for its housing and hay. And many bright, perfectly capable humans will find themselves the new horse, unemployable through no fault of their own. But if you still think new jobs will save us, here is one final point to consider. The US Census in 1776 tracked only a few kinds of jobs. Now, there are hundreds of kinds of jobs, but the new ones are not a significant part of the labor force. Here's the list of jobs ranked by the number of people who perform them. It's a sobering list with the transportation industry at the top. Continuing downward, all of this work existed in some form a hundred years ago, and almost all of them are easy targets for automation. Only when we get to number 33 on the list is there finally something new. Don't think that every barista or white collar worker need lose their job before things are a problem. The unemployment rate during the Great Depression was 25%. The list above is 45% of the workforce. Just what we've talked about today, the stuff that already works, can push us over that number pretty soon. And given that even in our modern technological wonderland, new kinds of work aren't a significant portion of the economy, this is a big problem. This video isn't about how automation is bad, rather that automation is inevitable. It's a tool to produce abundance for little effort. We need to start thinking now about what to do when large sections of the population are unemployable through no fault of their own. What to do in a future where, for most jobs, humans need not apply. Aren't you glad you just spent $60,000 on your kid's education? <laughs> Every That's, human used to. <laughs> that is a very sobering video. But I was just at a MIT the other day speaking to the very people who are involved in this stuff, and it's, it's going to happen. It's coming down the road. So the reason why it's so important to us is because, as he said, what are we going to do with all of these people who are out of work for no reason of their own, through no fault of their own? There are only two options, folks. One option is a really ugly dystopia where people have so much time on their hands and our society has had to redistribute wealth in a way so that they have at least a minimum, minimum ability to, uh, to survive and they are going to self-medicate with drugs and with alcohol and with other self-destructive behaviors and they're gonna, they're gonna escape into their nirvanas of their virtual realities and it's gonna be a very, very ugly reality or if the church is at the forefront, if the church brings the good news of Jesus Christ to the argument, we could actually have the greatest potential for human flourishing in history available to us to make life better for everybody. The difference is going to be whether the church is there or not, in my humble opinion. I think that is going to be the difference. And in the Industrial Revolution, the church was absent. We saw what filled the void. If the church is absent again, the dystopia is going to fill the void.
If the church is at the forefront of the discussion, the church has an opportunity to drive the discussion, to ensure that the machines are ethical, and to ensure that whatever happens in the general economy, which is beyond all of our control, we are ready for. Because we can bring something that science can't. We can bring the spiritual reality of the Imago Dei. We can bring the faith and the hope and the love of Jesus Christ into people's lives to allow them to flourish in ways never imaginable. Think about what life would be like, what communities would be like, what churches would be like if people had the kind of time on their hands that this technology is going to allow to happen. I, I teach a, a thing at seminary on financial responsibility and tithing. And I tell, I tell the, the, the students, look, you're going to go to your church and you're going to preach a million sermons on tithing. And we know that about 5% of the people are going to tithe. And there's a parabola effect. And the average is going to come out to about 3%, maybe 5% if you're in a certain kind of demographic, but the probability is you're not going to get people to tithe 10% across the board in your church. What if you had 10% of their time? What if you had 10% of their time? What could your church do? Think about that. And in some ways, that's what we're talking about. So if you want a really good book on the evolution of economics, get this book called The Relentless Revolution by Joyce Appleby. It's really, really interesting. And by the way, I'm going to skip through a lot of slides today uh, because these slides are taken from lectures and I can't get into the woods here. Uh, so I, don't, don't think I'm cheating you by skipping you. I'm sparing you by skipping you some of this because we don't want to get into uh, the weeds. So we know that agrarian economics molded into the Greco-Roman Empire economics, which molded into feudalism. We spoke yesterday about the fact that the church was complicit in this particular epic, which wasn't very good. Then came mercantilism, which was nothing more than basically state-run monopolies, but it was the sort of proto-capitalism until we got capitalism. And, and capitalism was driven first and foremost by the Industrial Revolution. And there were good things about it and there were bad things about it. The good thing about it is that technology Technology always creates wealth, right? Because what was my definition of wealth yesterday? It's the delta between the amount of labor and resources necessary for subsistence and everything else. So obviously, technology ultimately creates wealth. That was true of the Industrial Revolution. It created wealth. The problem is, there's a question of time, okay? How fast does it create wealth? There's always a lag time between the new jobs that are generated by new technologies and the jobs that are made obsolete by the new technologies. There's also the problem of concentration of wealth. Okay, and then there's the societal impact of whatever happens to support the new economy. So in the case of the Industrial Revolution, you had a very small number of people making huge amounts of money and you had masses of people suffering desperately. You had the migration from the country into the cities. They would live in slums, 12 to a room. You had child labor. And there was a dehumanizing effect because what happened? Human beings became extensions of machines. And it took generations for the new wealth to be created. And because the church was absent, we know what filled the void, and we'll get to that in a minute. But ultimately, what grew out of it is capitalism. And capitalism is a good thing. Okay? But you've got to remember something about capitalism. No one invented it. Adam Smith didn't invent capitalism. No one invented capitalism. Capitalism is a subject, not an object. Capitalism just evolved over time. And here, these are all the things I talk about to define capitalism in my class. I won't get into it, but here's the easiest thing to understand. Capitalism is nothing other than the monetization of economic activity in lightly regulated free markets. That's all capitalism is. And no one invented it. It just happened naturally. But it's a little bit like evolution. It happens naturally. But it has no moral compass of its own. Which is why we need to impose on human beings moral law. We have to have ethical standards so that we don't kill each other. It's the same with capitalism or any naturally occurring economic system. If we don't impose upon it a certain ethic, it will start to destroy itself and destroy us. And let me tell you when I really knew capitalism was in trouble. 
I was running a very large business in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And it was part of an even bigger multinational company. One day, the vice chairman of this company flew in to Europe and he sat down with us and he said, I need you to take $15 million of cost out of this business. I said, what? I said, we are making 8.5% return on invested capital and we were in basic materials and we were losing 15% of our profits to currency exchange. It was a high functioning business in the most difficult circumstances. He said, I don't care what you do, just get the $15 million of fixed cost out of this business. And he got back in the corporate jet and flew home. And I looked at the other board members and we all agreed we were going to have to lay off about 150 people. That was the first thing we were going to have to do. And you always lay off the mid-managers. Why? Because you know, they're the ones who cost the most and uh, so they're the people who get the ax first. And So I was a good corporate soldier. I did what I was told to do and started down the list and I thought I had a moral responsibility as a Christian to personally speak to these people. I'm sitting across the table from a, a French executive, mid-level guy, worked 25 years for the company. He had done nothing wrong. The company wasn't suffering an existential threat. This was a successful business. And I had to tell this 54-year-old man that his services were no longer required. Now he and I both knew that at age 54, he was not going to get a job at his level anywhere in France. That was not going to happen. So it was a death knell. And I went home that night and I said to my wife, I can't do this anymore. It's soul destroying. It's soul destroying. And I couldn't figure out why I was asked to do it. And I'm a relatively bright guy. I kind of know how business works. Well, you know when you have a publicly traded company, when executives exercise their stock options, they have to file a report with the SEC. And guess what? The fellow who'd made me fire those 150 people exercised 2 million stock options. He put $4 million in his pocket because of one conference call with the people, with the, with the stock analysts, and he said, I've got good news. The guys in Europe just laid off 150 people. They've reduced their, uh, um, their fixed cost by $15 million, and they're going to go from 8.5% to double-digit return on invested capital. Aren't we the best company in our sector? And the stock analyst said, boy, you guys are the best in the sector. Stock went up 2 bucks. He pocketed $4 million. And I had to lay off 150 people. That's wrong. That's, there was not an existential threat to the business. That's wrong. That's not real capitalism. Some of you may be sitting there thinking, well, it's just the way business works. It's, you know, it's survival of the fittest. Wrong. It doesn't have to work that way. It was pure, unadulterated greed. Now, here's the good of capitalism, right? Global wealth has exceeded global population forever. And since 1990, global poverty has been reduced by half. That's fantastic. And all of the good things like income inequality or, or, or income, uh, uh, um, the, the, the rise in income and, and uh, overall living standards and health and education and all of these things have all gone up. Capitalism works. No question about it. I'm not anti-capitalist. But there's also a bad you know, things like the collapse of Lehman Brothers and Baring, Baring's Bank and the Barclays LIBOR scandal. And I could go on and on. They're, all, they're in my book. I talk about these scandals in my book. And also things like the gap between rich and poor is getting worse to the point where it's becoming unsustainable. There are eight people that could fit around one of these tables. There are eight people on this planet with the equivalent wealth of 3.7 billion other people on this planet. I'm sorry. That's not right. That's just absurd that we produce that kind of wealth inequality. And by the way, Plato and Aristotle warned against it. So we've got a lot of issues here because you know, there's also the ugly. This one about the relationship between wealth and money is very serious, folks. After the Second World War, they had something called the Bretton Woods Conference, where the world leaders got together and the economists got together and they said, how are we going to ensure a stable world economy? And they came up with a lot of different things which we still live with today, right? Like the World Bank and other things. And they pegged every currency in the world to the U.S. dollar and they pegged the U.S. dollar to the price of gold. 
Okay? 1971, Richard Nixon took us out of the gold standard for good economic reasons. The problem is, if you go from a gold currency standard to fiat currency, which is currency which is tied to nothing, only the, the, the good word of the government that prints it, and you let those things float on the market, you start to separate wealth and money. Because money is no longer tied to anything that is objective. So if you look at what has happened to our economy, in 1971, the GDP of America is 1.2 trillion, and the dollar was worth 0.28 to our ounces of gold. Today it's 19 trillion, but a dollar is only worth 0.0008 to our ounces of gold, which means in real terms our economy has shrunk. But it doesn't feel like that, does it? Of course not, because we have a national debt, which is $20 trillion, and in the last economic cycle, we put $4.5 trillion of quantitative easing into the system. It's not sustainable, I just thought I'd tell you. It's not sustainable, but it's what's happening, okay? So that's what I mean by postmodern capitalism. It's just driven by greed. It's built on mountains and mountains of debt. As Christians, we should be really concerned about this. We should be really concerned about this because somebody's got to pay that bill or we have to default one or the other. And if we default, it's a meltdown. Well, guess what? No one in this room is young enough to ever have to pay that debt. So we're saddling future generations with that debt. We've got a situation where the average CEO of a corporate Fortune 500 company has a salary 771 times higher than the least paid full-time worker in their company. When I started out in business, 20 times was the norm. Some of you are old enough to remember that, right? You looked at the CEO's salary, it was usually published, especially if it was published, 20 times the lowest, 771 times. So the reason why these things are important is because if we don't do something about it, the hard left could fill the void. I'm sure most of us don't want that. Or, worse than that, nothing fills the void. And if the kind of ethic that drives our current economy is the ethic that decides how we're going to treat artificial intelligence and robotics, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. That's what this book is about. This is the book I just finished. It's called Redeeming Capitalism. Okay? And what my thesis is is very simple. My job is not to tell people how to fix capitalism from a technical standpoint. I'm happy to have a discussion with any of you if you want to talk about tax cuts, budgets, currencies, all of those things. Happy to talk about it. That's not what I talk about in the book. What I talk about in the book is the moral vacuum at the heart of our economic system. Because we can't fix the technical things if the people who are making the decisions on the technical things are devoid of a moral compass. So we as a church have got to speak into this. And the good news is we have great biblical tools. Starting with wisdom. Wisdom is one of our greatest tools. Proverbs 9, 1 through 6 is this beautiful description of wisdom. A beautiful woman standing on a hill calling out and inviting one in, everyone into her house to, to partake of the goods, the fruits of her wisdom. And the apostle uh, James tells us what those pillars of wisdom are. Their purity and peacefulness and gentleness and reasonableness and humility and mercy and sincerity. In fact, the Hebrew word for wisdom is not at all like the Greek words for wisdom. The, the Hebrew word for wisdom is hokma, which is observation and participation working together for the common good. That's the Hebrew definition of wisdom. It's the biblical definition of wisdom. We also have the cardinal virtues of prudence and justice and courage and temperance. Prudence being the mother of all. Do you know what Thomas Aquinas said prudence was? Knowing what to want and what not to want. And the problem with our economic system is people have forgotten what to want. They've forgotten what's, what's, what, what are you in business for? How many of you started businesses because you want to become millionaires? Most people not. 
Most people start businesses for much more virtuous reasons. They become millionaires, praise God. But then they realize they then have the burden of wealth if they're people of faith. Well, guess what? If you have people running businesses who have no burden of wealth because they have no sense of responsibility to the other or to the common good, you end up with postmodern capitalism. And justice, it's just, it's just simple fairness, folks. There's stuff going on out there that's not fair. And the church needs to speak into that. And, and courage. We're talking about spiritual courage. Having the courage to stand up. I stood up in a meeting once against the other executives in my company because they wanted to make a decision to treat workers in a way that I believed in my heart was fundamentally unfair and even illegal. And I put my neck out there and I stood alone against the rest of the board. One other person then joined me. And there were two of us standing against the board. And guess what happened? <laughs> didn't get fired, but we didn't win the argument. But we put our stake in the sand. And the next time, they knew where we were going to be. And the next time, if there's three, and the time after that is four, before you know it, people with a conscience control the board. That's what courage is. And simple temperance. I'm, I'm sorry. There's no justification for eight people having the equivalent wealth of 3.7 billion. There's just no justification for it, in my humble opinion. But then we have three things that go beyond that. We have faith, hope, and love. We have those things. We talked about faith earlier today, sharing our faith in the workplace. There is hope for the future. The beauty of what's coming down the road is, as I said, it's going to unleash human potential in a way that no one ever thought possible. There's great hope there. I have hope for the future. I spend most of my time with millennials. I always leave meetings with millennials hopeful for the future. I don't see them as snowflakes. I don't see them as, you know, privileged and all those things. I see them as skeptical and potential Christians, etc. Just like a lot of you now do, according to that thing. That's the way we have to look at it. Because you know what? They're bright. And they're a lot better educated than we were. And they're a lot more in tune with what's going on than we were. And lastly, love. I mean, what, what does the Bible teach us about love? It says that everything before us is temporary, including our wealth. Our wealth is going to get burned up. But three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. You know, if you think about what we're supposed to do, what our responsibility is as Christians within society, our responsibility is not to change society. Our, our responsibility is to inform the discussion in order to redeem society. We want redemption. We, want redem we aren't utopians. We don't want to try to manipulate society to look like us. We just want to share the gospel. We just want to be people of virtue. And people who observe virtue at work, it is irresistible, just like the gospel is irresistible. So if you think about how quickly things are changing, this is the bad news. Things are going to change, and they're going to change at breakneck speed. But Hi, I'm Ken Barnes. Sorry about that. <laughs> but the good news is, eventually, eventually, the wealth creation will catch up. The question is, what are we doing as pastors, as religious leaders, as workers, as members of the community to ensure that when the bottom falls out, and, and the bottom's going to fall out, this is not a doom and gloom prediction, it's just an economic reality that the technology is going to have the same effect in the future that it had in the past. It's inevitable. When that happens, who's going to be the ones calling the shots? The people who have no moral compass? Or the people of Jesus Christ as a moral compass. What are we going to do? And the thing is, we need to prepare now. We need to prepare now. When I was at MIT, I found out that they had an ethics committee. That they wanted people from religious communities on the ethics committee to talk about the fact that they need to program ethical decisions into these computers. Well, if the church isn't at the table, what are we going to do? <laughs> and more importantly, how are you going to harness that human energy? Just imagine. Imagine if you could. You have church budgets, all of you, right? And what happens every year when you do the church budget? 
you have an argument, right, over whether or not you should be conservative or have a, a faith, you know, budget, right? Everybody has the same argument in every church. Should we be conservative or should we have a stretch budget based on faith? Imagine if the sky was the limit for your budget. Because that's what's going to happen when people have that kind of time on their hands. And if we can harness it for good, there'll be no opportunity for the enemy to harvest it for evil. That's why this is important. Economics matters to God. Every economic decision ever made was a moral decision. Think about that. The decision for what coffee you bought today, where you bought it, what clothes you wear, every economic decision is a moral decision. And that is true on a macro level. So here's what I'd like you to think about in your groups. We're going to take about 15 minutes in the groups to think about this. One, how can you be a force for virtue and ethics in your current environment at work, church, or community? Think about that for a minute. How can you do that? And I'm not asking you to be foolish and, and fight every battle and get fired. You have to pick the hill you're willing to die on. There are some things that are just not worth dying on, right? But in what way could you be this force for virtue and faith in the workplace, in church, in the community? How can you, in your current circumstance, inform discussions about economics without getting dragged into the political rhetoric? The political environment right now is toxic. My recommendation is ignore it. But speak prophetically about love in economics. That's not political. That's moral. And lastly, how might you start preparing now for what's coming down the road? And it may not happen tomorrow, but believe me, it's going to happen faster than everybody thinks. The, the, the Industrial Revolution didn't happen overnight, but boy, it happened a lot faster than everybody thought. And we don't have the option to be Luddites. You can't break the machines. But if we don't have a place at the table, the machines can break us. In your groups, those questions, 15 minutes, and then we have lunch. Thank you very much.